Hello, everyone. This is the 65th episode of the Soccer Nostalgia Talk podcast. As always, this is Sean from Los Angeles, and I am joined by Paul from Shipley in England. For this episode, we interview Austrian blogger Mr. Wolfgang Berger and Mr. Simon Peter Karamza, the head of development at the OFB, the Austrian Football Association, as we discuss the matches of the Austrian national team during the fall of 1976 and the year 1977. Mr. Berger is the administrator of the blog rapidhammer.wordpress.com, a blog about Rapid Vienna and Western United. And as stated earlier, Mr. Simon Peter Karamza is the head of the development at the OFB, the Austrian Football Association. Good morning. Thanks for having us. Hello. Good morning. Good morning from Vienna, Austria. Hello. <laughs> Hello and thank you both for joining us. Can I just ask you to introduce yourselves and tell us about your early football memories and your history with the game? Well, I would start. I'm Wolfgang from, I'm not originally born in Vienna, but I'm, I'm living in Vienna. I have been living there for decades now, but I was born in, in Lower Austria, a little out of, of, of Vienna, about 25 to 30 kilometers. And my early football memories are when in school, we, we had to decide only between two clubs in Austria. It was Rapid Vienna or Austria Vienna. And I decided for Rapid Vienna because they had won 25 Austrian championships. But as I was a very lucky guy, I think, when they were chosen as my favorite club, it then took them 14 years to win the next Austrian championship, the 26th one. So <laughs> that's that's my first history of football. But I've never changed the colors, of course. I'm, a, 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 I'm an avid fan of, of Rapid Vienna. And when we were in grammar school, we also were interested at this time very much in, in English football. And everybody chose an English club. And first I was interested in Queen's Park Rangers, but afterwards I shifted to West Ham United. So you see, I never was a real glory hunter because also these clubs aren't those which win week in, week out. So, well, that's my my first memories. And what we are talking about Austria now, uh, an Austrian national team, I very well remember the game against the German Democratic Republic 1977 and this game was my first game in the great Vienna Stadium because I was not living in Vienna so it took me some time until I got to to games and this is a very very good memory of mine. Thank you. I'm Simon. I'm I'm the son of a very good friend of, of Wolfgang. Um, I was born in 1988 in Vienna in Austria. I'm a football fan since my I guess, fifth or sixth year of my life. Um, I'm a big Rapid Vienna fan as well, as Wolfgang is. I'm working in the sports business for approximately 10 to 12 years now. Um, I started at uh, AT. It's the biggest sports online platform in Austria. Um, And then moved to Rapid Vienna to work in the marketing department from 2016 until 2019 and then the Austrian Football Association called me and I took the chance and worked for them now and had the luck and the honor to attend at the Euro 2020 or 2021, how you want to call it, and travel with our national team through Europe. Thank you also. That was very interesting. Can you describe the state of Austrian football in this fall of 1976? In the fall of 1976, we could start there, but maybe we should only go back two or three years to 1973, because this was uh, some traumatic experience for Austrian football fans. Or maybe we should go back to 19... 19- 54. <laughs> well, I wasn't born uh, at this age, <laughs> at this time. But in 1954, Austria, they were third in the world championship in Switzerland. It was their biggest achievement to come third. At the time when they thought maybe they would be one of the best teams in the world, but they lost to Germany in the semifinal. 
And then they won against Uruguay in the small final. And then in 1958, they played in Sweden and they really weren't very good there. But in 1962, Austria decided not to take part in the qualification for the world championship. And this was a big mistake because at this time there was a second wonder team. Maybe you remember in the 30s, there was an Austrian wonder team, so-called. They were fourth in the world championship. But in the 60s, they also had a very good team in 1954. And then in the early 60s too, but they had decided not to take part in the qualification for the 1962 World Championship. And this was some traumatic experience because in 1966, 1970 and 1974, they failed to qualify through the qualifying uh, groups. And very traumatic it was in 1973 because Austria were with Sweden in the same group. And in the end of this group, Sweden and Austria were level on points and on goals. So there had to be a decisive match in Gelsenkirchen in Germany for the World Championship in Germany in 1974. And this game in November 1973, it was played on a winter surface, on a snow surface, but as well, Sweden and Austria are used to snow, of course, so it was no advantage for Austria. Well, Austria played very well, but they got two goals and they were two nil down in the first half. They scored then by Hattenberger. You will hear this name again, uh, the 2-1 before the break. And after the break, they played very well, but no goal was scored. And Austria lost this decisive game for the qualification for Germany. And they were out of this qualification. And again, they could not compete in the World Championship. So when it came to 1976, there was uh, almost 20 years which Austria had not been part of the World Championship. And for the proud and somehow thinking that we are a very good football country, it was a very sad state at this time. And also the Austrian league system had not been uh, very good because there were 16 or 17 clubs in the Austrian top tier. But for Austria, as a smaller country, this was too, too much clubs and this was not a real professional system, wasn't possible. And therefore, when, when the national team played bad or was not successful, and also the clubs in the European uh, Cups, they weren't successful, Austria decided to have a new league system. And in 1974... So shortly before 1976, which you have asked us, there's a new league system started and we changed from the so-called National League to the Bundesliga, Austrian Bundesliga, with only 10 clubs. Only 10 clubs were allowed. And from this day on, this was a good decision as well for the Austrian club football and the Austrian national team. So in the end, I think this was the time when everybody thought now it could go uh, better and Austria could achieve again something in the new qualification for Argentina 1978. So I think we were slightly optimistic, but not too optimistic at this time in 1976. Austria were drawn in a qualification group with East Germany, Turkey and Malta. What was the feeling about that, that group and the expectation for the Austrian team? We knew the German Democratic Republic quite well because we had played them four years earlier and had not been successful at this time. But Turkey, well, we, we didn't uh, think very good of Turkey, but of course they also were an opponent which uh, should not be underestimated. And Malta was also known very well because they had also been our opponents four years earlier. And Malta was always a, a tough place to come because in Malta, they had a hard surface to play with sand and not a, a pitch. And this was always very difficult, but uh, usually we could win. So there wasn't a club like Federal Republic of Germany, which we had played also in earlier qualifications or Hungary, which is the arch foe of Austria, which we had also played four years before. And um, well, there was not a gigantic opponent there but of course, with German Democratic Republic, it wasn't a group to take lightly. Can you tell us about the background of the Austrian manager, Helmut Senekovic? 
Helmut Senekovic is one of the most legendary coaches in the history of our national team. He had had big success in the 70s during his two or three year stint as a national team manager. And he took us to the world championship in 1978, uh, the topic we are talking about today. I didn't experience the time, but what you have to understand uh, as an Austrian is uh, that we don't have that many successes in our football history. And even if I didn't experience this tournament or the qualification before the tournament, it's one of the most well-known times in, in Austrian football. And my dad told me many things about that time. And, and I talked to Wolfgang a few weeks ago as well. And uh, he said as well that there was kind of a difficult connection between the manager, Helmut Senekovic, and the um, sports director, director of sport, Max Merkel. He often said if uh, Senekovic doesn't have success or immediate success, he will get replaced. And it was kind of a fun time. But in the end, a very successful time. And we got the prize, the winning prize, when we made it to the world championship. But in the end, it is enough in Austria to attend the world, at the world championship to, to become most of the, uh, one of the most popular coaches. So great guy. On September 22nd, 1976, Austria faced Switzerland at Linz. They won the match 3-1. Kranko scored in the 50th minute. Helmut Kogelberger in the 52nd minute and Wilhelm Kreuz in the 89th minute. And Serge Trinchero scored for Switzerland on a penalty kick in the 62nd minute. And let's look at the Austrian lineup. You have Friedrich Concilia of Wacker Innsbruck, the captain of the side, Robert Sara from Austria Vienna, Rudolf Horvath playing in his final match for Austria, his 16th and final cap, his first cap having 1968. He was from Wacker Innsbruck. Bruno Petzai of Wacker Innsbruck. Heinrich Strasser of Admira Wacker. Ronald Hattenberger of Fortuna Köln in West Germany. He replaced by Joseph Stering of Wacker Innsbruck in the 80th minute. Making his international debut, Herbert Oberhofer of Admira Wacker. Herbert Prohaska of Austria Vienna. Wilhelm Kreuz of Feyenoord in Holland. Hansi Krankel of Rapid Vienna and Helmut Kogelberger of Lien's Ask. Could we introduce some of the better-known players in this team, and who would you say were the, were the key players at this time? If you, if you take a look on the squad at the time, you can see that there are many players of Austria Vienna and, and Rapid Vienna are, were in it, in, in the squad. But this time, especially the Austrian players were one of the best in, in Austria. The team of Austria Vienna was very successful on an international basis. Some popular names are Friedel Concilia, like we call him in Austria. It's his nickname, Friedel. He was a goalkeeper, very successful goalkeeper. I guess he won the, the Austrian championship eight times, four times with Innsbruck. And four times with Austria Vienna. Then we had Robert Zara. He was a defensive minded player, but a very good one, good technique, quite fast. Also a very modern type of player at this time. He has like over 570 games played in the Austrian Bundesliga. So he must be around second, third, fourth position when it comes to most games in the Austrian Bundesliga. He won the Austrian Championship nine times. I don't know if there is any title left that Robert Zara hasn't won. Of course, uh, the most well-known player today beside Hans Kranke is Herbert Prohaska. In the qualification 1976-1977, it was like the beginning of his uh, biggest phase of his career. He had the bigger, uh, the best times still ahead at that time. But you could see that, that there is a new star coming in the Austrian national team, so that was quite clear. But he didn't have the status like Hans Kranke at that time, so... He's a little bit younger than, than Kranke, but he and uh, Josef Fikersberger were like the playmakers uh, in this team in the 70s. I don't know if I have to tell our listeners uh, anything about Herbert Frasco, because I think most of you uh, should know him quite good. He won the Austrian Championship as well several times. 
he was transferred to Inter Milan and AS Roma. So he had a big career in, in Italy as well. He won the championship with Roma. He won the cup title with Inter. He's a legend there. And uh, that's also good for Austria that we have some legends in, in other big football countries. Michael Konzl was a, was a great goalkeeper in the 90s for AS Roma as well. You know, Tony Polster, he was good abroad. And so that's really important for a small football country like Austria to get at least a few big players into other countries and do a little advertising for the football in Austria. And and uh, what I didn't mention yet, that Herbert Braske was elected to the best player in the 20th century. That's a little bit tough for Hans Krangel. Because I, I, I guess he also would have won it title, but Braska got it. Maybe his uh, successful career as a national team coach in the 90s was a benefit in this election for him. And do we know what any of these players from the 1978 team are, are up to today? Does the federation still keep in contact with these players? Yes, of course. I mean, um, Herbert Braska is a. Uh, TV expert for the biggest um, television in Austria. It's called the ORF, so the Austrian, uh, I don't know the English word for Rundfunk, uh, broadcasting, I guess. Hans Klanker also is the TV expert. I mean, they're funny guys. Football players from the 70s, 80s, 90s, they have a good sense of humor. They're funny. They give uh, good interviews, completely different than the football players today. Because of that, they're like omnipresent in the media, even if they're not the honest guys anymore. Every football fan in Austria wants to know what they are thinking about a game, a qualification phase, a player. There are still big guys in Austria. Yes, of course, the Austrian Football Association is, is keeping context to, to our legends. So we have a legends club at the Austrian Football Association and the two of them, like Hans Franke, Robert Zara, Herbert Prohaska, they're all part of the Legends Club and we have some events where the Legends Club attends. What can you tell about the late Bruno Petzai? Bruno Petzai, at this time, he was one of the, the younger players. He is a defensive player. He, he always was playing in the defense. At this time, we had a libero, for instance, in, in Obermeier, and the player in front of him, The, the stopper, so to speak, uh, or, uh, was Bruno Petzai. He came from Vorarlberg, one of the two smallest regions of Austria, from the most western region, and he played uh, then for Innsbruck, Wacker Innsbruck from the Tyrol. This is, was a very successful team in the 70s. Um, at the time we are talking about, he was uh, still playing for Innsbruck, but uh, after the World Championship in Argentina, he went to Eintracht Frankfurt, Germany, and then he played for Werder Bremen in Germany. And unfortunately, he died when he had already retired, of course, but he died at quite a, a young age because he died in 1994, was only in his 40th year during a game which he played uh, not on a level of uh, still, he was not playing a on the level of still league football, but it, it was just a, a friendly game with his friends, so to speak, and, and he died after this game, unfortunately. So he was, of course, never a manager, only for a short time as an assistant manager for the Austrian U21. But he was a very elegant player, and he also scored a lot of goals from his position going forward. And he was a very, very good player. So he would also be a big part of the Legends Club, of course, but unfortunately he died very young. Next, Austria played another friendly on October 13th at Vienna's Prater Stadion against Hungary. And Austria lost this match 4-2. Krakow scored both of Austria's goals in the 15th and the 51st minute. For Hungary, Tibor Nilassi scored in the fourth and the seventh minute and uh, Zoltan Kereki in the 53rd and 65th minute. Going through the Austrian lineup, you have Friedrich Concilia, Robert Sarah, captain of the side, Joseph Hickersberger of Fortuna Dusseldorf in West Germany, Bruno Petzai, Herbert Oberhofer, Roland Hattenberger, he replaced by Peter Concilia of Wacker Innsbruck in the 80th minute, Herbert Prohaska, Kurt Yara of MSV Duisburg in West Germany, 
Hans Pirkner of Austria Vienna. He'd replaced by Helmut Kogelberger in the 20th minute, Wilhelm Kreuz, and Hans Krankel. Let's talk about two other key members of his generation, Joseph Hickersberger and Kurt Yara. What can you tell about them? I think it's quite interesting because you mentioned Austria versus Hungary in the friendly game. My generation, or if my generation is asked about the big rival of Austria, it's, I guess uh, 90% of the answers are Germany is our biggest rival. But if you're talking to Wolfgang, my dad, or the generations that were born between 1920 and, and, and 1970, 1980 maybe, I'm pretty sure that most of them will answer the biggest rival is, is Hungary or was Hungary at, at least. And that, that's also interesting because, you know, we had a monarchy, Austria and Hungary. We were a big country in Europe at that time, so <laughs> we are much smaller now. But that also changed during the last decades that uh, our, our biggest rival isn't Hungary anymore. So we don't play very often against Hungary, even in friendlies. That uh, wasn't um, usual many years ago. So that's kind of interesting in Austria that our biggest rival has changed during the years and, and during the key decades. You asked us about Josef Hickersberger. I know him as a coach of the national team during the 2008 in Austria. And before that, he was a very successful coach for Rapid Vienna. The fun thing is that uh, he was a coach in the Arab region. Al-Afli was one of his stations. I think al Basel was also a club he coached. And then he moved back to Vienna to coach Rapid Vienna. And then I remember I was a young kid and, and asked myself and my dad as well, what do we do with a coach from the Arab region so they can play football there? That was my meaning at that time. But uh, he came to Rapid in his first season. We got the fourth place in the Austrian Bundesliga. But then it got better and better and he developed a very attractive team with a lot of creative players and he became a, a coaching legend for Rapids. So when he's entering the stadium, unfortunately, he's uh, not in, a, in his best condition anymore. But if he attends at the stadium, the stadium and the fans are freaking out every time and he gets a big applause. So that shows he's not just a legend because of his uh, coaching skills in Vienna. He's also very popular because he was a good player. He played uh, for Austria Vienna as well as for Rapid Vienna. That wasn't very common at the time. But he was successful and he's a good guy. And he was a playmaker at the time. So he was like uh, the number 10 until Prohaska came. At least Prohaska played with number 8. But you know what I mean. They were like, beside Hans Kranke, one of the most important players at the time in our national team. I could talk about Kurt Yara. You also uh, asked us about this guy. Uh, Kurt Yara was an offensive uh, midfielder or, or winger. Um, he was a very good player this time. He also came from uh, Vaca Innsbruck, from the Tyrol. And then he went to Spain in 1973. He played for Valencia. So he was one of the not so many legionnaires in the Austrian team at this time. At the time we are talking about, he had uh, gone to Germany to MSV Duisburg and he played for them and he was a very offensive-minded player. And I think he was a very important player in the Austrian team, always driving forward and uh, setting up good chances for the striker Hans Kranke. And afterwards, after his uh, uh, time in the team, he then went on to be a successful manager in Switzerland and also in Austria then. And his last job was for Red Bull Salzburg. He was, I think he was the first manager there when they started with Red Bull. Salzburg, and I think he was almost the only very well-known Austrian manager of Salzburg. But now he is not coaching anymore. From 2006, he, he stopped coaching and he didn't get a job anymore because there had been some speculations or 
some some bad things about money around him. It reminds me a little of Sam Allardyce, what he had told uh, uh, the press, Marie, how to say things which happen in football, but nobody talks about them. And if you well, if you have done that and it, it comes out, then you cannot be hired again. So it's the, the same thing with Kurt a little, but he was a very successful player and I liked him very much at the time he played for Austria. Maybe a little fun note uh, that I forgot to mention when I talked about Josef Hickersberger. When Hickersberger was a coach for Rapid Vienna, uh, the fans made a very funny song for him. So it's called Hey Hey Hicke. That's his nickname. And it's a very funny song. You know, the, the melody, the, the sound of the song is like the title song of TV series for kids that's called Wicked the Viking in German, uh, Wiki und die starken Männer. Maybe you know that series. It was a very popular TV series in Europe. I think it's a very good description for Hickersberry as well, because he formed a very young team to Vikings uh, during the years uh, Maybe our listeners get a new favorite song after the show. Next, we have another friendly. This time on November 10th at Kavala versus Greece. Austria won this match 3-0. Hickersberger scored in 11th minute, Krankel in the 62nd minute, and Petza in the 86th minute. Just going through the Austria lineup, we have Friedrich Concilia, Captain of the side Robert Sara. Making his international debut, Peter Persidis of Rapid Vienne, Bruno Petzai, Heinrich Strasser, Herbert Oberhofer, he replaced by Herbert Prohaska in the 75th minute, Joseph Hickersberger, Roland Hattenberger, Kurt Welzel, and he replaced by Helmut Kogelberger in the 46th minute. This was Kogelberger's final cap for Austria. This is 28th cap. His first cap had been 1965. Joseph Staring and Hans Krankel. Towards the end of the year, on December 5th, we have the first World Cup qualifier versus Malta at Gazira's Empire Stadium, as you mentioned, with the sand and no grass. For this first World Cup qualifier, Austria won 1 0 with Krankel scoring in the 57th minute. Going through the Austrian lineup, we have Friedrich Concilia, captain of the side Robert Sara, Peter Persidis, Bruno Petzai, Heinrich Strasser, Roland Hattenberger, Joseph Hickersberger, Herbert Oberhofer, Joseph Staring, he replaced by Herbert Prohaska in the 46th minute, Hansi Krankel, making his international debut Walter Schachner of Donawitzer, and he replaced by Hans Pirkner in the 81st minute. What can you say about this match? Well, it was a, a very hard fought game, of course, as always in Malta with these very strange conditions. Of course, it was not a, not a very beautiful game, but what counted was the result, and Austria won. 1-0 by a goal from Hans Krankel, as you said. But very important is also what you also mentioned, Jahan, that Walter Schachner, he gave his debut in the Austrian national team. What is very interesting about Walter Schachner is that at this time he played at the second tier club, Donowitz. They didn't uh, play in the Austrian Bundesliga. Anyway, he was a, a very good striker and he had scored many goals and therefore all the press and, and also the fans demanded to have him in the national team. And at this time, this was, uh, of course, quite strange. And it would also be today that the player from the Austrian second tier was playing in the team. But this was his debut and he was uh, playing until the 81st minute when he was replaced by Pirkner from Austria, Vienna, I think. And uh, it was very important because uh, afterwards, Schachner was becoming one of the, the best strikers in the Austrian team. And he also scored the first goal for Austria in the championship, in the world championship in uh, Argentina against uh, Spain in the first game. So this was the first game and he was a very, very important player during the whole tournament afterwards in Argentina. Johan and Paul, do you know the nickname of Walter Schachner? Nope. Austrians call him Schoko. 
that's like chocolate in German. Uh, do you know why he got this nickname? No. <laughs> because as a kid, when he started to play football, he loved to eat chocolate before every practice, before every game. This nickname was his nickname during his professional career as well. As Wolfgang mentioned before, he, he was a fun guy to watch at the pitch because he was a very fast player. So he ran down the right wing like nobody else in Austria. His technique wasn't the best, but he was extremely fast. And maybe you can compare it to Martin Hanik from the young or newer players in, in Austria. He was also very quick. Technique was, was good, uh, no question about it, but better known for being fast and uh, running down the wing and maybe score sometimes. But maybe a, a second fun story about Walter Schuchner. A little bit later than the time we are talking about now, at the World Championship 1982, there was the, the blame of Gijon, where Austria and Germany talked before the game to play. I'm a big Denver Broncos fan, by the way. And I listened to a Broncos podcast a few weeks ago, the Mile High Report. And they also mentioned, even if this is an American football podcast, they talked before the playoffs of this NFL season about the, the game, Germany versus Austria in 1982, because it is also well known in America as well, because it was such a blame that two teams uh, decide how to end the game. And the fun thing about this game is that every player knew what to do. So no player should score a goal. But Walter Schokoschaffner didn't know about the talks before the game. And he played with 100 and more percent. And uh, he was completely shocked that his colleagues didn't give the effort he expected. And he thought, uh, why I'm the only guy who wants to win this game. And yeah, so that's a fun story. And, and we're all always laughing when uh, Schaffner talks about this story at the current time. And is he still involved in the game as well? Is he still working in football? He doesn't work in, in, in the football business anymore, but he was a very successful coach in the early 2000s. He got popular as a coach when he was the coach of GRK, a club from Styria. They had great times around 2000. He won the championship with them. There's a, another fun story about Schaffner. At that time, the media did like a show goal standings because he as a coach was so successful for GRK and later for Austria Vienna. So it, it was like an additional version of uh, the standings of the Austrian Bundesliga because they want to show the people how successful Schoker Schaffner is as a coach. And they did a, the, the so-called uh, Schoker standings for many years because it showed that Schoker Schaffner, I mean, when he was coach for Austria Vienna, for example, he was there for, I think, approximately 30 games. And he won 12 of them, but he got fired by Frank Stronach because Stronach, the president at that time, thought that Austria Vienna needs a, a coach with more international experience. And I think they replaced Schaffner by Ari Hahn, the coach uh, from the Netherlands. But it's also, I guess, a funny story that Schachner was so successful at that time for four or five years as a coach, and, and he got fired by an Austrian-American investor at, at Australia. And so he had quite a, a funny career with becoming a star player for the Austrian national team before the World Championship 1978. Then he was the only guy who didn't know about the talk at the blame of Gijon. And then he was a good coach and also had to handle difficult situations like getting fired after being number one of the league, winning 12 or 13 games in, in this season. I guess it was like 2003 to, to 2004, approximately. Walter Schachner wasn't the best player, but he's definitely one of the best known here in Austria. And he did have an illustrious career in Italy as well in the 80s. That's true. That's true. From Donovitz to Italy. <laughs> another, another cool story. Ten days later, Austria had another friendly. 
This time at Tel Aviv versus Israel. Austria won this match 3-1. Vicky Perez scored for Israel in the 25th minute, and Herbert Prohaska scored, as well as Walter Schachner and Hans Krankel in the 55th minute. So for Austria, we have the following lineup. Friedrich Concilia, Robert Sara, again captain, Peter Persidis, Bruno Petzai, Heinrich Strasser, Herbert Prohaska, Herbert Oberhofer. He will be replaced by international debutant Gerhard Breitenberger of Voest Linz. We have another international debutant, Anton Pickler of Sturm Graz, Joseph Stering, Hansi Krankel, Walter Schachner. He will be replaced by Alfred Gassner of Admira Wacker in the 70th minute. And this was Gassner's third and final cap. He only earned three caps from 1971 to 1976. We come to the new year, 1977. And Austria has another friendly against Greece, this time at Vienna Prater Stadium. Austria won this match 2-0. Robert Zara scored in the 32nd minute and Walter Schachner in the 54th minute. For Austria, we have Friedrich Concilia, Captain of Isar Robert Zara, Peter Persidis, Bruno Petzai, Gerhard Breitenberger, Joseph Hickersberger, Herbert Prohaska, Kurt Yara, Joseph Stering, he replaced by Peter Concilia in the 76th minute, Hansi Krankel, Walter Schachner, and he replaced by Hans Pirkner in the 62nd minute. On April 17, 1977, we have Austria's second World Cup qualifier, the first one at home. They faced Turkey at Vienna's Prater Stadion. Austria won this qualifier 1-0 with Walter Schachner scoring in the 42nd minute. Going through the lineup, we have Frederick Concilia, Captain of the side, Robert Zara, Peter Persidis, Bruno Petzai, Gerhard Breitenberger, Roland Hattenberger, Joseph Hickersberger, Herbert Prohaska, Joseph Stering, Hansi Krankel, and Walter Schachter. What do you remember from this match? When Turkey came to Austria, it was somehow an away game for Austria because at this time, many people from Turkey were working in Austria, like they also the same uh, like today, and also in Germany, of course. And many of them came to Vienna to watch this game. There were 60,000 fans in the Vienna Prater Stadion, which was the name of the big stadium in, in Vienna at this time. Now it is, it is called Happel Stadium in remembrance of one of our best uh, players and managers, uh, Ernst Happel. But at this time it was the Prater Stadion. And I think it was not only Austrian Turkey on the pitch, but it also was Austria versus Turkey on the terraces. And in the end it was... Uh, not uh, one of the best games for Austria. We were very optimistic because Austria had, had won uh, all the three games prior to this match. But we were lucky that Shoko Schachner scored the 1-0 in the 42nd minute. In the end, it was more of a hustle and a kick and rush. And it was not the very best of Austria, but it was very important to win 1-0. And this was even more important because uh, in the first qualifying game uh, of this group, German Democratic Republic had only drawn with Turkey 1-1 in Eastern Germany. So they had not won their home game against Turkey and Austria had won the home game. So this was very, very important to win this game. And at this time, we, we thought that it would be possible to qualify after 20 years for the first time again for the World Championship. I think that's a very important information. And when you look at it in the ret retro uh, perspective, maybe it was like a sticking point in that qualifier because we won against Malta just 1-0. Turkey defeated Malta 4-0. They played draw against East Germany. So they showed that they're a, a very competitive team until our first game against them. 
like Wolfgang said, it wasn't a good game to watch because uh, both teams knew that they shouldn't lose the game. Uh, so there was much pressure on both teams, but we won it. And I think I didn't talk to the players or the legends from this game, but I can imagine that it was like a push for the team because the Austrian uh, team saw that they are able to beat every, every team in this group. When you look at it in the retro perspective, it, maybe it was the most important game to be so successful in that qualifier. Just a couple of weeks later, on April 30th, Austria played its next qualifier against Malta at Salzburg and demolished Malta 9-0. Hans Kranko scored six goals in this match. In the 9th, 12th, 18th, 20th, 53rd, and 66th minute. Joseph Staring scored in the 30th and the 69th minute. And Pirkner in the 65th minute. For Austria, we have Friedrich Concilia, Captain Vesa Robert Sara, Peter Persidis, Bruno Petzai, Heinrich Strasser, Joseph Hickersberger, Roland Hattenberger, Herbert Prohaska, Joseph Staring, he replaced by Peter Concilia playing in his final match. This was his sixth and final match for Austria. His first match had been 1975. So he replaced Staring in the 78th minute. You have Hans Krankel, Walter Schachner, and he was replaced by Hans Pirkner in the 46th minute. Very easy win for Austria. Easy, but very important because Austria knew from the qualification for 1974 that the score is very important because at this time, if they would have scored one goal more than Sweden, then there wouldn't have been this decisive match we talked about in 1973. And they also knew that now it would be very important to have a high win. Therefore, they also played, de uh, decided not to play in uh, Vienna because in Vienna this, the ground would not have been full, but they decided to go to Salzburg to a, a small stadium, the late stadium Lehen, which is now, uh, which isn't the stadium in which uh, Salzburg, Red Bull Salzburg is playing now. There were 80,000 spectators present. And uh, Austria knew uh, that they would have to score from the first minute. And yes, they were very, very offensive playing. And it was Hans Krangel who scored six goals in this uh, game. And uh, five goals uh, were scored in the first half. And the 9-0, it was the highest score for the Austrian national team up to the date, I think. So it was very, very important to win this game and to win with a very high score. At this time, Hans Kranke scored so many goals. I remember a game almost at the same time or a little later in Vienna for Rapid Vienna. He scored in an 11-1 win against GAK. He scored seven goals. So Hans Kranke was at this time our, so to speak, free-flowing scorer. And he's uh, also, as we talked before, one of the, the legends of Austrian football and, and of Rapid Vienna, of course. And after the season of 1977-78, he also got the golden boot in Europe. He had scored 41 goals prior to the World Championship in uh, Argentina. And he was the uh, most popular player at this time. And of course, he was also one of my heroes uh, at this time. And I was very proud to meet him in a fan club meeting and got an autograph from him. And he was the best player at this time or the most popular player, of course. You mentioned that the win against Turkey had made the public and the press aware that they could qualify for the World Cup. I'm assuming that followed by a 9-0 win only further heightened expectations as far as qualification. Like always in Austria, if, if we get some good wins, euphoria is extremely high in a small country. But if we lose the next game, everyone is completely depressed. So it's uh, very typical for Austria to have very highs and, and, and extremely lows. Of course, the, the entire country was very, very positive minded at that time because the team played well, got some good wins. And the 9 0 against Malta wasn't the best, it wasn't the worst sign that we could get to the World Championship. 
Well, we should also mention maybe that at this time, not only Kranke scored uh, four goals within 10 minutes, but there was also a new slogan for the Austrian team. At this time, it is said that this was the first time that the fans were singing Immer wieder Österreich, which is up to now one of the songs of the Austrian national team. And it was somehow it invented that this time, always again Austria, always again Austria, how, how you would <laughs> translate it in English. I'm not sure what would be a good translation, but it was this, the song Immer wieder Österreich, which Uh, was always present after this game in Salzburg up to, to today. Austria would end this first season 1976-77 with a friendly against Czechoslovakia at Ostrava that ended as a scoreless tie. For Austria, we have Friedrich Concilia, captain beside Robert Zara, Eric Obermeier of Austria-Vienna, Bruno Petzai, Gerhard Breitenberger, he replaced by Heinrich Strasser in the 75th minute, making his international debut and actually playing his only match for Austria. We have Peter Meister of First Club Vienna, then Joseph Stering, Herbert Oberhofer, he replaced by Hans Pirkner in the 75th minute, Herbert Prohaska, another international debutant playing his one and only match for Austria. We have Werner Zanon of Wacker Innsbruck and Hans Krankel. We come to the 1977-78 season. For the first friendly of the season on August 24th at Patrick Stadion, Austria hosted Poland and defeated Poland 2-1. Joseph Stering would score in the 15th minute and Krankel would score the second in the 29th minute and Kazimierz Kmiecik would pull a goal back for Poland in the 71st minute. For Austria, we have the following lineup. Friedrich Concilia, captain of the side Robert Sara, Eduard Krieger of Club Bruges in Belgium, Bruno Petzai, Gerhard Breitenberger, Roland Hattenberger. This season, he joined Stuttgart in West Germany. Herbert Prohaska, Kurt Yara, Joseph Stering, Wilhelm Kreuz, and Hans Krankow. Ahead of the uh, the game against East Germany, what was the general feeling in Austria? How, im how important was this game? Well, we were looking very much forward to this game, but of course, we also were aware that it would be the most difficult of all the games to face East Germany because they really were a mighty team at this time. When you remember four years earlier, they had beaten West Germany at the World Championship in Germany. And of course, we knew also Turkey should not be underestimated, but the most important games and the decisive games would be the two games against East Germany. And both of them would be played in autumn of 1977, first in Vienna and afterwards in East Germany. At this time, everybody knew that these were the decisive games and the Austrian Footballing Federation or the president of the federation was very nervous. Over the summer, he had appointed Max Merkel as a sporting director and president of the Austrian Football Federation. He was a, a labor union chief, Karl Sekanina, and they were always pushing Senekovic and, and the team, they were always pushing them and they, always saying, uh, if you don't win against Eastern Germany, well, then maybe Max Merkel could take over and so on. So there was always very, very much pushing from the, the president. And we as the fans, we were very optimistic because uh, the 9-0 win and now being first in the group with one point more than Eastern Germany, this was a very good situation for us. But we knew it would be the decisive game. And it was my first game in the Vienna Prater Stadion. Of course, it was sold out. It were, there were 70,000 fans present. And I remember I had taken a red and white flag with me to this game and it was really it was really a, a frenzy and it was a very very hot atmosphere of course there will be much drama in this match it, it was extremely important in both games against east germany that we scored the first goal 
And if you face um, a bigger nation, uh, mostly a better nation, when it comes to football games, our best chance to to be successful is uh, to get the first goal. Because with the fans in your back, with uh, the euphoria in the team, that's a, a job we can do. So scoring the first goal and then defending until the end of the game. So that's maybe that's a good part of the Austrian mentality when it comes to football games. And as I mentioned before, it was extremely important for us to get this uh, very important uh, one nil. And in the end, it was a draw. Germany scored the equalizer even before halftime. But it was enough for us to get that draw, to get that point and stay undefeated in, in, the, in the qualifier. Like you mentioned, Austria scored through Wilhelm Kreuz in the eighth minute. And East Germany would tie the match in the 39th minute. It was a strange goal because East Germany were awarded an indirect free kick because Concilia had taken too many steps with the ball. And Martin Hoffman scored from the ensuing indirect free kick. Going through the Austrian lineup, we have Friedrich Concilia, Kapnavisa Robert Sara, Eduard Krieger, Bruno Petzai, Gerhard Breitenberger, Roland Hattenberger, Joseph Hickersberger, Kurt Yara, he'd be replaced by Herbert Prohaska in his 78th minute, Joseph Staring, Wilhelm Kreuz, and Hans Krankow. Wolfgang, explain to us what happens near the end of this match. As you already mentioned, Austria had conceded the 1-1 in a very strange situation because the referee, he was from Wales. His name was Tom Reynolds. He had a bald, he had not very much hair. And we always say, we always saw his uh, shining, uh, shining head from from upstairs, and he was uh, in 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 every situation he decided against Austria. So we were very much against him, and not only, of course, the fans, but also the players. They opposed many of his decisions, and of course, this uh, one one. When the Austrian keeper Friedel Concilia, he made more than four steps. At this time, uh, we had the four steps rule that the keeper could only hold the ball for four steps. It had been cha- it has been changed about 2000. That now there is a, I think it's a six second rule or how do you call it? Uh, but at this time, that yes. was the four steps rule. Yeah, and he awarded this indirect free kick, and the Austrian lead was gone. And in the second half, Austria was again uh, very good, but they knew that they had to score again, and it was. The, but they didn't until the 86 minute. But in the 86 minute, it was Hans Krankel again who had a header, and this header was the two-one. And we were, of course, we were outraged. We were happy. Everybody was uh, jumping around, but only for one second. Because then Tom Reynolds from Wales said, no, there was an offside of Sepp Staring. Sepp Staring was offside. But of course, Staring had not intervened into the game. It was a passive offside. But of course, the referee uh, had a different mind. And the, the goal was annulled. It didn't stand. And Hans Kranke, he was so furious that he almost <laughs> almost pushed the referee and he had to be held back by his, the other players. And of course, he got red carded and the match ended 1-1. It was really a shame what had happened. And of course, Tom Reynolds, I think it never came to Austria again. <laughs> and well, <laughs> it was when we had scored the 1-0 we were so happy. And I remember, as I mentioned before, I brought this red and white flag with me and the flag broke. The stick of the flag broke because I was so euphoric that I had uh, waved the flag so much that it broke. And it, somehow it was the same afterwards. Not only my the stick of the flag broke, but also our hearts were broken because we, we thought we had won it. And then we were stolen this win. But of course, this was a very, very, very important situation because in the in the time from only a couple of weeks, I think it was only two weeks from this game to the reverse game in Leipzig, they grew together in adverse times. The slogan was now more than ever, 
we will do it in Eastern Germany, even without Hans Krankel, who was, of course, because of his red card, he couldn't play. But it was somehow like a miracle because now the team really came together so much and there were five players from abroad, from legionnaires and 13 players from the Austrian Bundesliga. And they really got a team in adversity at this time. And so I think all of the drama which happened was important in the story to qualify. This return fixture on October 12th at Leipzig also would end in a 1-1 tie. Ronald Hattenberger would score for Austria in the 43rd minute and Wolfram Lowe of East Germany would tie the match in the 51st minute to give Austria an advantage for qualification. So for Austria, we have the following lineup. Friedrich Consiglia, Captain of the side, Robert Sara, Eduard Krieger, Bruno Petzai, Gerhard Breitenberger, Roland Hattenberger, Herbert Prohaska, he be replaced by Eric Obermeyer in the 86th minute, Joseph Hickersberger, Kurt Yara, Joseph Staring, and Wilhelm Kreuz. Qualification was within sight after this match. What do you remember? Well, what I will always remember is when Hattenberger was played free and he was running on himself onto the goal. And when he scored, this was a sheer joy, of course. And uh, afterwards, it was like Simon has said before, it was a defense battle from Austria. They had been 1-0 up and then it ended 1-1 in the end. And we were very, very happy and we were very optimistic then that we could qualify for the World Championship. And the Austria played very, very well. It was Pohaska who was a very good player at this time, as we remembered before, but but he was not always playing in the team. For instance, in the 1-1 in Vienna, he had not played. He had come in for Yara only in the second half. But in this game, when Kranke was not available, it was Prohaska playing in midfield together with Hattenberger and Hickersberger. And they were very, very good at this time. And I think that also Austria was maybe better than Germany. They could have scored a 2-0. And it was a very, very good game of Austria. In the end, of course, it was again 1-1. But Friedel Concilia could also hold out all the, the shots from Germany. And it was a very, very good game in front of 100,000 spectators uh, there. And in the end, when Germany left the pitch, I think they knew that they would not qualify this time. And it was advantage Austria. Yeah, so this, this result meant that it would uh, come down to the final match in Turkey and that a win would be enough to qualify were you optimistic? Was what was the general mood ahead of of this game? In the beginning, where I think also Austria thought that they would maybe also qualify with a draw because they had scored nine goals against Malta in Salzburg, and therefore even with a draw at this time uh, a win was only two points so even with a draw and the better goal difference they would qualify but in the meantime when austria were traveling to izmir the german democratic republic played a little earlier against malta in potsdam and they also won nine nil so it was the same result as Austria had. And therefore, now Austria would have to win and the draw would not be enough to qualify and to, to be ahead of Eastern Germany. So now we knew we would have to win. The general mood was it would be possible. But what, what do you remember? <laughs> not of this time, but of the things which uh, your father has told you, Simon. <laughs> I think the mood in the in the entire country and especially in the national team was was um, pretty good. They knew that they were really competitive, so team spirit was great that time. And not many people thought that we can lose this game, but it got very close in the end. But we will talk about it uh, in a few moments. It was a great time in Austrian football in general. Because uh, today, if, if you win one or two games, okay, there's uh, kind of a euphoria after some wins, after some good wins. 
But when we lose a game or two, then all the euphoria is gone, like I mentioned before. But in the 70s and 80s, the self-confidence of our fans and of the team was, was much stronger. So even a loss couldn't pull us down. And it was a very successful qualifier in general. So we were all pumped up and very confident uh, before the game. This match in October 30th at Izmir, Austria would win 1-0. Herbert Prohaska would score in the 71st minute. Basically, Krankel's cross from the left side was stopped by the goalkeeper and Prohaska was right at the doorstep and knocked in the rebound. For Austria, we have the following lineup. Friedrich Concilia, captain of the side Robert Sara, Eduard Krieger, Bruno Petzai, Gerhard Breitenberger, Roland Hattenberger, Herbert Prohaska, Kurt Yara, Joseph Staring playing in his final match for Austria. This was his 26th cap. His first cap had been in 1969. And we have Wilhelm Kreuz and we have Hansi Krankel back. For Turkey, it was also a very important game. And they had never lost in Izmir in this stadium. And when Austria came to Turkey... They thought that they would play in the same kit as they had played in the German Democratic Republic, in the away kit. At this time, it was red shirts and white shorts and red socks, and not in the traditional white shirts and black shorts. So Austria had brought with them only the, the red shirts because they thought they would play in their away kit. But the Turkish team decided to play in red, And they said, we will play in red, you have to use your white shirt. But Austria, for some reason, they had brought black shorts, but no white shirts to Turkey. So they had no shirts to play in because they couldn't play in red shirts. And therefore, they got Turkish shirts. The Turkish team gave them the white shirts, which were the away shirts of Turkey. But Turkey had a red bar on the chest with the Turkish crescent on it. And Austria could not play with a Turkish crescent. But uh, of course, then the solution was to tear off the crescent. But Austria played in white shirts with a red bar and they have on the shirts and they have never played in these shirts again. <laughs> and this is a very funny story. And uh, it shows that uh, Turkey really did everything to make it very difficult for Austria. It is also said that they made so much noise in the night that the Austrian player couldn't sleep in the hotel and before the game. They throw oranges onto the pitch on the Austrian players. So it was a very, a very hostile mood there in Izmir. And Austria had to play in, in Turkish shirts. Well, in the end, it was Herbert Prohaska who scored the goal. And we call it in Austria the Spitz from Izmir. Maybe, Simon, you could just explain what this means and why it is still a, <laughs> a popular word until today. The goal itself is, is very popular until now, until today, because it was a toe punt. So Rohaska did a very, very, very long step to the ball and put it with his toe over the line. And everybody knows who is a football fan that kicking the ball with the toe isn't the finest way to kick the ball. And therefore, in, in Austria, we call it Spitz. And it's the toe punt from Izmir uh, when you translate it. And it's uh, one of the, the five most famous goals in Austrian football history. And of course, it was the door opener to the world championship for us. So it's, it's somehow really a joke because Prohaska is really such an elegant player and a, a player who, who really plays a very beautiful game. And this most important goal, maybe which he has ever scored in his uh, career, he, it was not a beautiful goal. It was just a, a goal with the toe, which is not popular to score a goal like this. And it is really a paradox somehow that this elegant player has scored this ugly goal, which brought us to the World Championship for the first time after 20 years. Wolfgang, describe the excitement and the euphoria of the qualification when you were at home at this point. 
yeah, for me and for many other young people, it was the first time that Austria qualified in their lifetime. And everybody was very euphoric and very happy about that. And it was a very good time, as Simon has mentioned some sometimes for Austrian football, because at this time, also Hans Kanke scored many goals and in the end next year he got the gold boot and also Austria Vienna was doing very well in the European Cup. We were very euphoric and very happy that we had qualified again in the end. And we thought that this was some kind of rebirth for Austrian football. And after the qualification, were those players, the, the more famous players like Krankel, Prohaska and Kreutz, were they being noticed outside Austria? Were they being noticed abroad now? Yes, I think they were because some of them already played abroad, like Willy Kreutz. He played in the Netherlands for Rotterdam, but Krankel and Prohaska still played in Austria. But as I mentioned before, Paul Haske was playing for Austria Vienna and they had a very good run in the European Cup of Cup winners. And Krankler was scoring many goals and he was fighting then for the gold boot and which he finally got with 41 goals. And they were noticed by the football press abroad, I think, very much. And Austria, uh, having bet- beaten uh, East Germany, this was really noticed. And they had qualified again after 20 years for the first time. Well, the famous players of Austria were noticed very well by the football press, as far as I remember. And we, we shouldn't forget Walter Schoko, the chocolate man, Schachner. He made some impact in our game. He was a rising star with fast speed. And I think it was uh, the, the basis for his international career at that time. Well, and, and Hans Kanki went on to, to play for FC Barcelona. After the World Championship, he was transferred from Rapid to Barcelona and he won the Cup Winners' uh, Cup with Barcelona. And I think this was the first European Cup which Barcelona won with Hans Krankel scoring a goal and he really became very famous afterwards. Paul and Jean, do you know for which transfer sum Krankel transferred to Barcelona? I don't know the sum, no. It, it was a 13 million shilling that was the Austrian currency at the time. So it was around 2 million German mark. So very, very cheap guy if you compare it to, to modern standards. <laughs> oh, yeah, well. Well, remember, at the time, the record transfer would have been like just over a million, I'm assuming, around that time. Yes. So, yeah. but, I mean, that time he was an expensive player, of course, but it's, it's ridiculous if you watch it, the sums in the 70s, 80s, maybe 90s, uh, and compare it to the sums these days. It's insane. But that's business. Can you discuss the general tactics employed by Senekovic during the qualifiers? The general tactics of the Austrian national team, of our national manager, was to play a 4 3 3 formation. That means we had two fullbacks, and in the middle, we had a libero and a center back. And then we had three uh, players in the midfield and three in the attack. So this was the, the, the general tactics as the, at this time. And of course, what was very important was the, the quick wingers like uh, Shoko Schachner. And in the midfield, we had very good technical players like Herbert Prohaska and Hickersberger and a more defensive-minded player like Hattenberger. So you see, it was a team of Bergers. Of Bergers. Uh, I'm, my name is also Berger. <laughs> there were many Bergers at this time in the Austrian team. <laughs> uh, well, and, But it, uh, it doesn't have to do anything with burgers, yeah. the American food. So it's not the same. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's, it, 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 The original <clears throat> meaning comes, I guess, from Berg. It's, it's the German word for mountain. Finally, at the end of this season, was there a feeling that this was a rebirth of Austrian football, that there was a, a bright new generation coming through? Yes, uh, there yes, was a course. feeling. Yeah, there was a feeling that now this was would be a rebirth of Austrian football and that uh, Austria would go 
to a new wonder team and to new success after 20 years again playing at the world championship this was a very big success and a very big achievement but we weren't aware of what was to come because we didn't think that we would do so well in the world championship because we got a very difficult group with brazil with spain and with sweden so we weren't aware of what was to come but we were very optimistic It is a little bit disappointing now because it was a really good team with superstar players like Krankli and Verhaska. And yes, the team was successful. And yes, it was kind of a rebirth of our national team. But the expectations were higher than the reality showed because, okay, the qualification for the World Championship 1978 was nice. The qualification for the World Championship 1982 was nice as well. But the expectation was that we could or should reach the quarterfinals, maybe the semifinals. But those expected uh, successes didn't happen. And I think you can compare it really good to the current uh, national team with uh, stars like David Alaba, Marko Anatovic, and, and all the legendaries we have in our roster right now. It's a really good team with a lot of players of the German Bundesliga, really experienced players in the German Bundesliga. David Alaba transferred to, to the biggest club in the world last summer, in summer 2021, to Real Madrid. But the success in the national team isn't that good as fans would expect it so yeah our performance at the euro 2020 was good but in the end uh, the qualification in in fall 2021 for the world championship next winter in qatar didn't go out as we as all expected in our country so i think those two teams like the national team in the 70s and 80s and the current team they're Pretty similar, really good, good players, but as a team, not good enough to, to have really big success. Like, for example, the Belgian national team the last years. I, I think from when you when you look at the, the player names, they're like Austrian names and, and those teams are pretty similar, but the Belgians are way more successful than, than Austria is. To say it one more time, I think those two teams are pretty similar. In a future podcast, we'll pick up at the year 1978 and the World Cup adventure. Once again, we would like to thank Mr. Berger and Mr. Karamza for their participation in this interview. As always, feel free to leave questions and comments. For questions and comments, you may contact us. You may contact me on my blog and on Facebook under Soccer Nostalgia. On Twitter, I'm at SP1873. Mr. Paul Whittle can be contacted on Twitter at 1888letter, and his blog is the 1888 letter. You may also follow the podcast on Spotify and now on ACAS, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher, all under Soccer No Soldier Talk Podcast. Please leave a review, rate, and subscribe if you like the podcast. And I have included Mr. Berger and Mr. Karamza's contact information as well. And all this information is listed on the blog and the Spotify listings. So once again, I would like to thank both of you for sharing your memories. Can't wait for the next one, 1978, whenever we get to it. Thanks, Rahan. Thanks, Paul. It, It was a pleasure. And keep doing such a great work with your podcast it's uh, really funny to talk with you and you're the both of you are really big freaks so uh you you know everything about football that's that's great well, well, thank you for being thank, kind. You. thank you yeah and thank yeah, you both thank very you. much yeah thank yeah thank you very much too it was really a pleasure and a joy to remember all the things which uh, now very many years back it was a great time with you thank you very much thank you thank you